My name is Neil Cocker. I, I'm helping uh, organise these events, hopefully bringing something a little bit different, uh, trying to make uh, these events uh, more useful and hopefully more appealing to those people who attend. Uh, and obviously for you as busy entrepreneurs and, and founders and um, key employees of, of companies, uh, we want it to be uh, a useful and actionable stuff coming out of these. So we're keeping them short. So the new format for the time being, um, uh, let me just let this new member uh, in. Right. So the, the format for the time being is obviously this little bit of housekeeping. It's going to be nice and short couple of minutes at the most. Um, this is a really interesting and important topic. I don't think any of us have not been affected by um, the shift to remote working. So I think uh, this is really going to be a key topic. Uh, perhaps the most important one we could put right at the beginning of the year. This session is being recorded. If you have any concerns about that, drop me a line. My contact details uh, are coming Oh, someone saying uh, you can only see my screen within uh, a window rather than the full screen so if you go to the top of your and put uh, change the view there's a view button right at the top of your screen change that to speaker view uh, and my screen should be nice and visible to you let me know if that's not the case uh, you're going to get two emails off the back of this event. Um, it's really, really important that uh, particularly one of them, which is the AG3, which is to prove that you are here um, so that everyone gets paid for, for putting these events on. They're really, really important. Uh, so please fill that in. Um, and like I say, for those that haven't already, introduce yourself, your company in the chat. Give us a sense of what kind of thing you do, what sector you're in, what size the company is. That'll help. Sharon and I make sure this event runs smoothly and is tailored to your needs. And finally, this is the first in a new season of webinars and we're really keen that these webinars really reflect um, your needs and what you need as growing companies. So please, please drop me a line if you have any ideas on format, uh, speakers that you would like to see, topics that you would like to see, that kind of thing. So after this uh, housekeeping is over, we're gonna have the presentation. It's 30 minutes long. So uh, all we're asking, go to speaker view, put your screens on full, give Sharon your full attention for 30 minutes. Uh, you'll really benefit that way. Uh, avoid the temptation to check and respond to emails and Twitter and uh, doom scroll through the, the terrible things that are going on in the world. Uh, Sharon's gonna tell you how you can make your teams better. So give her your full attention. It's only gonna last 30 minutes. Like I say, bang on speaker view, drop a message if uh, you don't know how to, uh, you're all muted up, so that's great. Um, use chat for communicating. If you have any questions, uh, I will relay those. I'll be monitoring the chat so I can relay those to uh, Sharon if you do have any questions. Oh, one thing I should say, with the suggestions for future speakers, I'm particularly interested in underrepresented groups. I don't want uh, all our speakers to be people who look like me. Uh, I want to find... Um, a more diverse and a more representative bunch of speakers for us in the in the future. And finally, we're going to do a few minutes of Q&A at the end. It just have, depends on how many questions you have. And importantly, uh, the speakers from now on will be giving 15-minute um, one-to-one sessions with anyone who wants them. So I'll drop that in the chat uh, after Sharon's presentation. And uh, yeah, you'll be able to book 15 minutes with her at some point over the next week. It doesn't have to be today. So at some point in the next week, you'll be able to chat to Sharon one-to-one -one and get her expert advice, which is something we've never really done before. And we think it's going to be uh, really vital. Um, Sharon's website there, you can contact her via her website and her Twitter. And obviously drop me a line uh, via my email, neil at neilcocker.com or via Twitter if you have any suggestions, queries or thoughts. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand over to Sharon right now. Um, and I won't introduce Sharon. She's all I can tell you. She's an expert. She's brilliant. We spent quite a few hours over the last couple of weeks chatting about this presentation. She'll introduce herself and tell you uh, everything there is, uh, uh, there is about her work. And uh, I really hope you're going to find this informative and really actionable. So uh, Sharon, uh, over to you. 
Thank you. Uh, and thank you everyone for, for taking the time to join us today. I'm going to quickly share my screen. Hang on just a second. There we go. And then put that on presentation view so you can see the detail. Um, so yes, so my name's uh, Sharon O'Day, as Neil said, and I'm going to talk today about the um, I talked to you about the benefits of remote and distributed working and also more particularly and hopefully some actionable things you can take away how you can turn remote work into a, a real driver of strategic advantage for your own business right yep, hang on don't let me click on there we go right okay so to begin with let me uh introduce myself there we go. Um, I'm a communicator by training, but I'm a, a lifelong geek. So I've been working at this intersection of kind of communication, collaboration, technology for about, about 15 years now, maybe a little bit longer than that. Um, I focus particularly on digital communication, digital collaboration, both inside organizations, but also looking at how organizations collaborate with their customers, with their partners, so that they can deliver more effectively. A little bit of background. I started off in the public sector. I watched for the House of Parliament um, on a lot of their mobile apps for members and their intranet site. And then I moved into banking. So I was head of digital communications for Standard Chartered, uh, first in the UK and then over in Singapore. Um, and then about five years ago, I founded my own consultancy practice, that's Lithos Partners, um, and we advise on three things really, um, digital communication, digital collaboration and digital experience, and there's a lot of overlap between all of those things. These are some of the companies that I work for. But um, more personally, I've been working remotely myself for nearly a decade now. So firstly, like a lot of us, only part of the time and then starting my own business for the majority of the time. And like all of us for last year, pretty much permanently. So I've been advising companies on how they use digital channels to communicate and to collaborate, whether they're on the road, working face to face with their customers or clients or at home or, of course, in the office. So with that focus on working from anywhere, um, as you can imagine, last year has been quite busy because I guess everyone's focus has shifted to to remote work. So those tools, but more to the point, those ways of working have suddenly come into much sharper focus over the last year or so. So I'm going to talk to you today about some of the learning I've had from that journey um, and, and how you might be able to use some um, use some of those lessons in your own work. To give a little bit of an overview of what I'm going to talk about, um, I think there'll be three things. First, I'm going to talk about what we mean by remote work um, and what benefits it has for, for businesses. And then I'm going to move on to, to the what and, and the how. So how can you do this yourself um, and become a, a remote, remote first kind of business and see some of those opportunities? And then I'm going to finish off by, um, by talking about some of the... Um, the more practical steps that you can follow to become a remote first business yourself. And then finally, as Neil said at the end, we've got about 15 minutes for questions. Right. Um, so it's weird to think that it's a, a year ago, this, this was how we worked. So I traveled to meet clients and, you know, you'd find a meeting room, put your laptop down, have a chat over a coffee, or maybe in like the cafe or canteen of, uh, of the client workplace. But we keep our colleagues in the loop by, by talking to them whenever we need to. So we know what's going on because we can overhear what other people are doing. We observe what people are doing. We ask questions when we need to find out more. So even for people like me who are extremely online, this is a very normal and natural way of getting things done. There's a lot to recommend it. There's a lot of things that happen in this sort of space that just help us to work more effectively. So some things are much easier when you can see people face to face. We can learn from others by copying them. Uh, the critical thing is in this sort of context, communication is really easy. So we do it without even thinking about it. You know, we pick up on each other's moods by simply seeing the look on, on their face. You know when someone's having a bad day, it just shows, right? Um, but all of a sudden we, we can't do this anymore and that's presenting some challenges in how we get work done. So I don't need to tell you, but you know, obviously last year everything changed. It does only feel, it's a year ago, but it feels like a lot longer. COVID happened and necessity being the mother of invention, we very quickly reconfigured what we do to work within within the constraints of uh, social distancing, but also a very rapidly changing environment around us. I think for a lot of us, and it's certainly for a lot of my clients, the first few weeks were really tough. So people rushed to set up new channels, but more to the point, they had to learn how to use those. So we did a lot of that as well against a really challenging backdrop. You know, people were, were worried, they were scared and confused. And I think what's 
admirable in many ways is, is, is that for the most part, businesses did a really incredible job at adapting. And those that found it easiest were those, of course, that were already working in more flexible, agile type of ways. So those that already had the culture and the tools to support this way of working were much, found it much easier to slip into a different kind of working mode. And the opposite of that, those that struggled the most were those which were uh, less flexible. So um, banks, for example, with a lot of legacy technology that use a, a lot of on-premise type technology really struggled. But regardless of where you, you started from, over the last, what is it, 10 months now, remote working has moved on by several years at least. Um, and within that time, we've all adapted our ways of working as well. It wasn't just one than the other. We've, we began with all of those endless Zoom calls, but we've started to adapt to move, move, use more nuanced approaches. So mixed methods, things like mixing up real-time communication like video with more asynchronous methods. How do we use email? How do we use messaging? So actually each of us as individuals and our teams and organizations have rapidly adapted, developed, our remote communication collaboration skills. We found new routines, we've established new ways of working and, and that's been really important. It's been an incredible learning experience for everyone, even if we wouldn't have chosen to do it the way that we did. Um, so in that initial lockdown, actually a lot of us developed new habits. Um, I still haven't made a sourdough loaf, but I have made a podcast, um, but this, Data shows that, you know, some of the things that people have been searching for online. So you can see over in this one here, obviously the searches for restaurants went down pretty rapidly as we weren't able to go out, but people started to look up, you know, buying dumbbells, uh, cutting their own hair, whatever it might be, buying, buying yeast, um, watching movies at home. But what's interesting is some of these other changes here, things like buying standing desks or investing in an electric bicycle. So because this great home working experiment has given us a chance to try out new ways of living and working. And some of these are changes that employees in particular really want to keep for the long term. You know, we're starting to kit out our offices at home. We're starting to think about more permanent shifts in how we get about. There are actually a lot of things that people like about this new way of working. And we're now at this inflection point. So we kind of know we're in this for the long haul and there's lots of things that people want to do potentially permanently. So uh, a survey by Okta found that three out of every four workers wants to keep working flexibly once this pandemic is over. Um, and even before all of this kicked off, flexible working was one of the most sought after perks uh, for workers. So 42% of people said that they would take a pay cut to continue working flexibly. And that's a number that increases much more for groups like uh, working parents. Another little interesting statistic uh, is that actually remote workers are much more likely to stick around. So um, our labs do an annual state of work report and they found that remote workers or people who have access to the option for remote work tend to stay in their job for 13% longer. There's a lot of potential there looking at things like recruitment and retention. Um, but in summary, it's clear that people really like flexibility and they always have done. But having tasted that flexibility you know, on mass all year, people are really keen to keep that at least part of the time. So this is going to be critical for employee satisfaction in the future. Um, and helping people to, to manage their work-life balance in, uh, in the years to come. But obviously there's benefits for the business as well, not just around, you know, employee satisfaction is a really clear benefit for remote work and improved employee satisfaction itself has impacts on retention, on productivity. But it's also critical to remember that happy employees tend to have incredibly positive impacts on customer satisfaction. You know, if, if someone's dealing with a happy employee, that reflects in the quality of interaction they have um, with your staff. So there's a real win-win there. But there are some other business benefits that I think it's worth, um, worth thinking about just for a minute. Now, the, the obvious one that you've probably thought about is, of course, cost reduction. So... For most companies, office space and travel as well are, are some of your biggest cost commitments. But after the last however many months not doing that, a lot of people are starting to question, is the, the office space that I'm currently buying or renting or uh, paying for uh, what we need in the future? Are there potential, is there potential there to reduce that and therefore reduce our overall costs? Um, effective remote working might mean going fully virtual, having no offices at all. But for most companies, it's probably around reconsidering what space you use and where, what roles need an office, what people need an office, how will you bring people together and, and so on. Um, 
small word of caution, I would caution against approaching this from a purely cost saving perspective, because this is an area where you, you need to invest to save um, in things like systems and skills and culture. I'll talk a little bit about this, uh, but there are huge savings to be made. So typically several thousand pounds per employee uh, that you could potentially save without radically changing your operations or business structure. Another uh, business benefit there, of course, is access to talent. So um, removing the geographical obstacles that separate employers from employees uh, means that you can hire from a much wider pool of talent um, and that potentially makes it easier to, to mitigate skills gaps, to hire gap, um, skills that might be difficult to access through an area like language skills. Um, and this can potentially be a benefit as well if you're looking to hire more diverse teams. So in general, you know, the pool of applicants you can access is considerably wider if you are no longer tied to a specific geography. A clear gain is, uh, is two sides to this one, productivity and agility. So if you have people working at home, it's much easier to scale your business up and down um, in a way that, that is more difficult when you, when you have to rent physical spaces. Um, there's a bit of a myth in the past about home workers being kind of lazy pseudo professionals without real jobs and I think the last year the great home working experiment proved to many people even the most kind of reluctant employers that you can be just as productive working from home and in many cases you maybe are even more productive so um, increased efficiency among remote workers is, is largely linked to having increased autonomy. So it means that people have fewer workplace distractions, more freedom to work at the time of day that they are most productive. Um, so there was a um, survey by Airtasker so of Daily Habits, and it found that remote workers spent more time taking breaks, but also they devoted more time to work tasks. So it's just you're able to allocate your time more effectively, and there are a fewer distractions. And that, of course, has um, some clear benefits. And then one final one that I'd like to call out, there are others, of course, is about uh, sustainability, reducing your carbon footprint in particular. So remote work means fewer car journeys, fewer plane trips, uh, less need to heat a big office space. And that, of course, is good for the environment, good for your electricity bills, um, and in turn, good for business. So some obvious wins there. So to summarize, remote working is here to stay. Employees want it. It can have positive benefits for people, for the planet, and particularly for your bottom line, but it can also make your business more flexible, more productive, more adaptable. Um, and that itself is a, a real driver of strategic advantage. But what does that look like? Um, it probably doesn't look exactly what, what you're doing today. I see this having three, uh, three levels, three stages. There was where we were before, which is the sort of pre-lockdown, the old business as usual. And then, of course, last year we had this in-between phase, which is kind of a recovery mode. We did, we did what we had to do to build immediate capacity, to keep the show on the road, to meet our business and customer needs against a fairly challenging background. But if if we're to seize seize that opportunity of remote work, when we need to look to a next phase, one where we're not just cobbling together what we can, it's it's an integral part of our strategy to be remote first, to help our businesses to be agile, sustainable, and reduce our cost base. Um, so this kind of a new next normal, whatever you want to call it, which is growing through your remote work. Um, and it's a movement that's gaining a huge amount of support in the corporate world as well as in the SME sector. So Barclays, for example, are talking about making their remote working a permanent move. Um, other examples are Facebook. Facebook talks about 50% of their workforce working remotely in the future. Uh, Siemens is another, and it feels like every week another big employer talks about how they um uh, how they, they're looking at a kind of flexible work or remote from uh, work from anywhere policy. So briefly, I'm going to touch on a couple of definitions. So these are remote work and flexible work are often used interchangeably, um, but they actually mean very slightly different things that are worth calling out here. So remote working means detaching your work from, from a physical place. So it means working from somewhere other than your employer's estate for either all or part of the time. That could mean working from home, but it could also mean working on the road or working in a third space, like a, a co-working office locally. Um, now, flexible working um, is working to a schedule that's not fixed. So working at a time of your choosing, and it usually means um, having a bit more flexibility of the work that you do with a bit of a focus on outcomes rather than, you know, working a set number of hours. 
But moving to more digital first ways of working broadly just means that work is not a place, but it's an activity that you do. And once it becomes that activity, you have the option of, of distributing it across place and time. And that creates a lot of opportunity to be, to be more flexible, to work more asynchronously. Um, so at this point now, we're starting to look at the, the light at the end of this dark COVID tunnel. So we're starting to look what, at what what work will look like in the long term. And we start to think, what does this remote first future uh, look like? And what do your, does your business need to do to work in more distributed ways? Now, when I'm approached by clients, um, often it's because they're looking at tools that they, they're looking at to help with collaboration with communication. So things like Slack or Teams or Zoom, and they might want help with selecting a tool or building adoption or use of, of those kind of tools. Um, but to my mind, this is probably the wrong place to start. Uh, to, I would always suggest start with assessing where you are now. So most of our remote work practices were cobbled together. Um, pretty much overnight. So it's, it's just sensible to review them and take a strategic and planned approach moving forward. To begin with, you know, what is working well? Thinking about that little set of graphs I showed you earlier, what are the things that people want to keep from this time that they've enjoyed, that they've appreciated? Um, what benefits are there for the business? Where, what are the areas where this has really been a success? Um, and, and this is something we want to build on in the future. But of course, in that review, we also want to, you know, think what isn't working so well? What are people struggling with? Um, what things used to be really easy when you were co-located, but suddenly people are finding difficult? And it might be that these, you know, they were fine at the beginning, but the cracks are starting to show a little bit as we go on. Um, so begin by talking to employees and you'll identify those areas of strength that you need to build on, but also where you need to address barriers to make this work for everyone in the long term. So once you've got that picture of where you currently are, your current state and uh, levels of satisfaction and what your potential challenges that you need to overcome are, actually we, we need to rethink how work gets done because this is an opportunity to do things differently. How could we do how can we do work differently if we're not wedded to place and not wedded to time? So actually it's, a, it's good to sort of step back and break down what it is that you do fundamentally, how do you do it and question all of that. How could you do it differently? So some small examples might be, if you're freed from having fixed office hours, can you change the way that you provide customer support? Do it over maybe a longer period, support more markets. Uh, an obvious change, of course, is how you use office space. You know, you may not need desks for everyone, but what do you need space for? How much? And then you can start to think what savings might be made. But I think my key point here is that we need to, to rethink the entire end-to-end -end process of what journeys, uh, what customer journeys do we have? What does that look like? How can we, we rethink delivery and rethink operations rather than simply try and replicate the office-based ways of working that we had in the past? Um, so through this process, so beginning with your employee needs and wants, and then the nature of your business and what your business does, you get this clear idea of, of the potential to radically rethink um, the way that work gets done so that you can make remote a strategic advantage. And then we can look really at planning how you'll work in the future. So that means my, finding the right mix of tools for sure, but those tools have to align with um, your culture, the type of work that you do, um, but also critically, and this is one that is often overlooked, ensuring people have the skills to work in more distributed ways, because um, it is a different way of working and it does demand us um, and demand everyone in the organization to approach it differently. Uh, and it may be appropriate for some teams more than others. So really we're looking at, yes, finding some, the right kind of tools or platforms to help us communicate, but actually, what works for our culture? How does our culture need to evolve? And do people fundamentally know how to do this or, or do it effectively? Or what might we need to do to upskill people? So actually, when we build this picture here, we start to get a, what does our future business look like? And what do we need to evolve to get there? Um, once I've kind of got with clients and I'm, I'm looked at that picture, I often help them to identify what tools or they need to, to do this or how they need to evolve their capabilities. So this is just an example of, um, of something I've made for a client. Um, but actually, once you've agreed how you get work done, you, your next thing you need to do is sort of agree some ground rules. Excuse me. 
So the first one <laughs> to address is, of course, what do we mean by remote? So, you know, I showed you that slide there of uh, flexible versus remote. Thinking about that, you know, do we have some minimum standards about when and where people can work? Are there core hours we would expect people to work? So, um, for example, Google recently asked all of their employees to go back to the country they're employed in. And the reason they've asked for that is because um, they're happy for people to work remotely within the US or within a specific country. But once people are actually working long term in a different country, then it starts to become much more complex from employment law and taxation and so on. Um, and that's something they're not prepared to address at this point, which makes sense. Um, so once you've agreed kind of what those the boundaries are within which, you know, are you going to allow people to work completely flexibly? Is it only appropriate for certain rule, uh, roles or types of work? Um, actually, it's agreeing how we will work together. So as I said, this is an example of a toolkit that I, I've used. Um, and I won't go through every single line. It's not clickable because this is just a screenshot. But I, I will point out some areas that are definitely worth considering. First thing is, of course, what are your basic ground rules? How do people get started? What policies need to evolve to support more flexible ways of working? Uh, you know, that would be absolutely where I'd begin. Um, but then actually, the next thing is to have, you know, what are our routines? Or what are our ways of keeping in touch? Now, the, this works best when each team agrees the right touch points among themselves. But one of the challenges that we, we often have with this is managers are not very good at coming up with this stuff. So it may be that we need to think about giving people a good toolbox of ideas of approaches that then they can discuss with their own teams and find out what works for them. Oh, excuse me. Um, sorry, <laughs> I accidentally clicking on that. Um, so yeah, I've got some ideas here for like daily routines. I, some of these tools that I use here around what are our principles? How do we work together? And there are some other little tools I use here around user manuals. So I, I in other organizations, I've asked um, each member of a team to just sort of lay out, here's how I work. This is how I like to be, um, I like to keep in touch. This is how we organize my work. Just so that the other people in the team uh, kind of understand where they're coming from. You get a sense of, uh, it's kind of a user manual. Um, and um, below this, I've also put together, um, and this is always useful, some best practices on how to do all of these things, because um, things like, you know, how do we manage a, a meeting when we're working remotely to make sure that that is effective? Um, so, and there's some kind of shared understandings that you'll need to reach within each team as well. So basic stuff like where do I find information? Where do I store files and data, particularly, you know, thinking about if you're using personal identifiable information? Now, there is a lot here. Um, but I think a critical point is that um, we assume people know how to communicate and to collaborate, but remote actually forces us to do it differently. Managers in particular will need to, to develop their communication skills. Um, but within each team and as a broad organization, we need to agree and understand and plan how we will work together and how we will communicate. We need to move beyond having this kind of mishmash of approaches that we've just put together over, over the last uh, year or so and actually think about what is a, um, a more joined up approach as we move forward so that we can effectively work as one organization and work as effective teams and units. So that, as I said, there's a lot there, but one reason um, there is a lot there, I suppose, is that it's critical to help people adapt to working in a different way. And working in this kind of way demands two things of people. The first is that it's absolutely reliant on trust. Um, when you can't see someone, you know, across the table, across the office, you, you have to trust that they're getting on and they're doing what you, uh, what you need them to do. Um, and secondly, it forces us to communicate. So we need, we all of us have to communicate much more regularly and much more actively. And that communication is, is essential in building and maintaining that trust. Um, so managers will need to develop their communication skills and we'll need to, they'll need to communicate or coach their own teams to communicate with them. So the type of communication that remote work demands is, um, much more intentional, much more explicit. And that may be countercultural because we're used to it being implicit. We can't pick up what people are, are doing in the office. We need to actively share what we're doing. Um, so everyone, and in particular line managers, will need to develop their communication skills so that they are able to offer that honest, regular and open communication. Um, in the last few months, people have kind of muddled together through kind of borrowed trust or 
best endeavours, but it may be that those cracks are starting to show as, you know, as people are getting boredom is setting in or people are no longer feeling challenged. So it's, it, this is a great time to, to strengthen your processes and really invest in remote working skills. And there's a, a bit of a flip side to that as well, which is as we shift to the long term, many are asking how we measure performance and productivity. You know, you used to be able to pull someone up for coming in late or whatever it might be. It, it's much harder to do that sort of thing when you're at a distance. Um, and it, it's challenging to think how we measure some of this. But one of the key functions of management is, is supervision. So firms want to know that people are pulling their weight, particularly if you're in a regulated industry. But that means that we need to relearn how to build remote teams so that people are accountable, that trust is built and maintained, but people are accountable for their own delivery. So managers will need to plan kind of clear expectations for remote worker performance, uh, establish guidelines for your flexible work protocols and say, you know, where's the beginning end? Um, I would always advise going for an outcomes based approach, you know, switching your focus from hours worked to what are the outcomes we're delivering. Other organizations will turn to kind of employee monitoring. I'm not a big fan of that. There's been a lot of talk about it in the news recently. Um, it may be appropriate in some kind of organizations to do things like tracking screen grabs and so on. Employees might ultimately decide that having some loss of privacy is a price they're prepared to pay for that, that flexibility, but it very much needs to be an informed decision. So you need to think and plan and discuss with your teams and organizations about how you'll measure performance. I guess my key takeaway here would be you must give your managers a range of options and approaches that they can agree with their own team so that there is an informed trust relationship on both sides, recognising that this is a different way of working um, and one that may be a little countercultural to people. So summarising a little bit of that process, in 2020 we moved from this old state to this, you know, old normal, so this recovery mode. Uh, but now we face a second change, a second challenge. We're adjusting to a long-term or a permanent change where primary, the primary mode of working is remote or flexible. And in order to get there, we need to firstly, you know, review where you are, understand what's working, how it could be done better, what opportunities are there to be realized. The next step is to create a plan. What tools will you use? How can you evolve your ways of working in the months ahead? And that plan can, you know, um, trickle down into teams as well so that they can, they can agree their own ground rules and agree to evolve their own practices. Um, and it's also worth considering what do you need to change to get there to make you a truly remote first business? So it could be about investing in, in um, an upgraded set of tools or whatever, but much more likely it would be about developing your processes, your policies, and particularly upskilling your staff so that they are better able, uh, more capable to work effectively when they are remote. Um, so across everything I've talked about, today, uh, there are some clear principles. The first is, of course, by reviewing where you are, taking the best of what is working, rather than trying to recreate office work at home. Um, <clears throat> make sure that we understand what barriers there are to effective communication. And really, we need to talk to um, ideally one to one or through some surveys and so on, to understand what challenges people are experiencing uh, with the current you know, recovery type mode. Think about how we can ameliorate these, how we can overcome some of those challenges. We need to help people to build their skills in communication and collaboration so that they can really embrace that asynchronous working. Uh, and I guess my key takeaway there is that trust is absolutely essential here. We, it underpins all effective remote working. So we really must think about how trust can be built and sustained at scale for, for the long haul. Um, so I think that's it from me, but I'm going to be open for questions from I'm pretty much on time. So thank you very much. And I shall stop sharing there. Wow, thank you, Sharon. Um, okay? uh, firstly, yeah, thank you. Firstly, for you know, a speaker who delivers almost to the minute exactly what was was offered is a is a rare thing. So uh, <laughs> you took quite fast, though, so you might have questions. <laughs> That's quite <laughs> right. So um, my first my first thought really, um, I I'm going to come to a few questions in a second, but I, I wanted to say that what's interesting here. I was listening to a podcast the other day about remote working. And it was more around the economic development uh, side and how cities get built with remote working or on remote work, as I should say. Mm -hmm. And one thing that was really, really interesting was that one of the experts on there said that basically talent is the only thing 
that matters now in economic development because you know building factories or you know whatever the, the building buildings mm -hmm. I suppose is not an economic de development policy um, and I sh really that brings me to the point that um, you may those of you in the audience may wonder why it's so sunny there that Sharon has to have a her curtains closed. Uh, for those of us in, particularly in South Wales, I don't know what it's like up, up for the North, but Sharon's actually speaking to us from Amsterdam. And I think nothing could highlight this fact more than the fact that, Sharon, I don't think I have enough money to attract Sharon to a, uh, to a business park in Bridge End on a cold, January, Tuesday. So um, thank you for joining us from Amsterdam. And I only heard the bells from the church opposite you once okay. at quarter past. So, um, so the first question I have, and you touched on it a little bit, um, Albano said he sort of had concerns around quality and you kind of, you know, quality of work rather than quantity of work. You touched briefly on that whole kind of thing around outcomes. Uh, mm. rather than hours worked can you is there any sort of research to back that up or is that you have any thoughts on how to you know just being managers having confidence that they're going to get the quality of work this is a, a huge challenge and I think it's one that as that trust has started to stretch a little bit that people have started to come across it's an ongoing challenge I think we had even when we we're in the office how do you measure outcomes performance that we we have a tendency to measure throughputs which is you know the number of calls you did but ultimately it's about what metrics you deliver whether that's sales or you know creating a new product or whatever the actual outcome of your job is um, this is a challenge I think HR, HR teams have been attempting to um, to deal with because we, it's often in, in a, particularly if you're a knowledge worker it's very difficult to measure what you do at the best of times so in the absence of being able to measure outcomes for a lot of us we do switch to measuring outputs which is you know the number of things that you do or the um, Hang on a sec, I've got to tell my husband to open the door. <laughs> David? Again, more examples of uh, the challenges Sorry. of remote work. Um, this is perfect. It's almost like this is all scripted. Sorry about that. He's not answered <laughs> the door. It's postman. Hang on just a second. Okay, no problem. Um, um, if anyone else has any questions, please put them in the chat. What I'm also going to do now is put a link in the chat for Sorry about those that. of you who want hoping... to book a 15-minute session with Sharon anytime over the next week. So uh, that link is there. You can just book directly into her calendar uh, and you'll be able to get a, a, a sort of 15 minute one to one with Sharon, who will uh, be able to dive deep into your particular concerns. Sorry, Sorry you, about you that. Saying, I was going to yeah, flow like... and the door went. It's you, the postman. <laughs> um, where was I? Yeah. So we've all we've long had that challenge between kind of separating outcomes from outputs. And then, of course, being remote means we can't really measure the outputs either because you kind of can't see when someone's coming in. So I think we need to kind of go back to that outcomes based approach. You know, what is it that ultimately what's the why does your job exist? What is it that we all, you ultimately need to deliver? And it, I've, I've discussed with a few people recently. And there are a few interesting approaches that people are doing, which is actually potentially splitting out pastoral line management from performance line management so that you're, you're dealing with those two things separately which is you know are you struggling thinking about the duty of care side of it separately from measuring your performance management um, and that may help to make it less emotive for people um, but ultimately I think it goes back to the trust thing how can we help people to um, ensure there is effective trust on both sides. And that, that's about having a, accountability. The best way to get that accountability is regular check-ins. So ensuring that your um, channels of communication are, are open and regular. And I know we've all done it when you're a line manager in the office, you know, like I have a weekly one to one. We really need to be much better at actually, you know, is it a daily check-in? Is it that we have a chat window that is open so that those lines of communication are, are open? Okay. Um, yeah, I think absolutely. Uh, I think this it's the difficult balance, isn't it? Because we're all sort of over zoomed or zoomed out. Uh, but we also want to be able to check in regularly with uh, our line managers or whoever, whoever we need to. Uh, a quick one, you, you, there was a stat you mentioned, someone wanted clarification on that 42% of workers would happily take a pay cut to continue. Yeah, that was from, let me go back to my slides. I wrote it down. I was like, Oh, this is, it, this was pre pandemic. Yeah. Um, it was from. I remember now. 
Octa? Oh, Octa said, no, Octa's survey was much more recent. Uh -huh. um, and that was the one with three three out of four um, employees said they wanted to keep working remotely at least part of gotcha. the time. You know, and, and I think we've seen that with a lot of people over the last years. They're like, actually, it's been quite nice being able to pick my kids up from school. Less nice when they're there all the time, maybe. But, um, <laughs> you know, if... But actually, there and people are finding. Of course, there are some things that are more challenging. But actually, I personally don't miss squeezing on the seven fifteen train. I'm not sure many people would. Um, but there are lots of things that people like about this new way of working that we we can help them to keep. Um, but I know my old employer. So I worked for Standard Chartered for quite a few years. They've started to make flexible pre-pandemic started to make flexible working a real retention tool, particularly for returning parents. So they, instead of giving people massive pay rises to stay, they'll allow them to work from home, which allowed you then to live further from the office, which actually, you know, has positive benefits elsewhere as well, as well as the obvious things if you, if you are a parent, like being able to do nursery drop-offs. So people will always make those trade-offs. I think having experienced those now people are probably less keen to start squeezing on the 7.15 train. Although yeah. there will be some people who are desperate to spend of course, time not of course. with their kids. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to keep people too much longer. I've got a couple of quick questions here. Then if you can keep your responses to these pretty quickly, Sorry. Uh, if if uh, <laughs> if that's uh, possible, and that's not uh, the, just because they're big big topics, and I think thirty second sound bites isn't perhaps fair to ask of you. But um, on that last point, uh, Ronnie's asking basically about retention is there you know are you aware of any evidence that those companies that are remote first or have a hybrid uh, approach retain their staff better are they happier do they stay better so there... I think the jury's out on this one in so far as and I think it will depend on the quality of your remote work so I did pull up that stuff earlier that said remote work organizations tend to keep their staff for 13% longer that was before so it used to be that right. so for, i told you that example of standard chartered they used it as a tool like you can get this remote work lifestyle here that you probably wouldn't get elsewhere in an environment where everyone is offering that it's not a sell by itself so yeah. actually if you if i can one of the primary reasons we don't leave our job is because we like our colleagues so i you know we go in we like seeing them every day they're nice people they help us out the challenge we have when we're all at home a lot of us will have colleagues we've never met. Um, so we don't have that same relationship anymore. Um, and actually that makes the friction in switching a lot lower, doesn't it? So if, right. if, if yeah. moving jobs for me just involves getting a new laptop sent or a new log on from my existing laptop, it, we will find talent comes, you know, goes out the door a lot quicker. The way to counter that, in my view, and I think the jury's out on you know, an evidence base for this, would be how do we build that strong culture? How can we make sure people do like each other? What is it that would stop me leaving my job? And that will probably mean, you know, it's going to be months before we can do this, but how do we help people to build those relationships so that I, I, I do rely on my colleagues, so I do feel like I have some connection to them, so that we do have a culture that people want to stay for? Otherwise, we get into the realms of having to throw money at people not to leave, and that's not always a great environment. Great. Um, and we have a question. Uh, let me just, so it's from Andrew. Uh, productivity improvement of individual working remotely is perhaps simplistic. <coughs> uh, collective productivity and resource effectiveness, departmental or organisationally, is more challenging. Uh, collective productivity. Sorry, I'm just uh, passing that. Sorry, go on. Do you, do you, I, go ahead. Yeah, this is a, do you know, this is a really tough one, but I'm happy to pick it up in the in office hours after. This has been a massive debate. So, um, teams and so on have started to release new dashboards where you can get things like productivity metrics but it's based on things like how many emails people send as an organization you're above or below um you know averages it i find that quite a simplistic uh, and overly reductive way of measuring you know technically i'd get more points for sending five emails of one sentence than one succinct email that described what i need to do to do and then we're incentivizing the wrong kind of behaviors yeah. so I find those kind of, it's just difficult to measure these things at scale and it will depend on the type of work that you do. Um, the challenge we have is um, the extent to which that starts to become become creepy, become a surveillance culture as well is, yeah. is challenging as well. Yeah, it's interesting. I've got a good friend who's a lawyer and I think she's really struggling with, uh, they, they are you know 15 minute blocks. Yeah. Uh, and you know I come from a very different culture but although she's measured on, you know, and, and, and I think 
big law firms like that are going to have a big struggle because I don't think they can. She's a single mum with two two mm. kids, right? I, I don't think it's quite the quite as easy as uh, just going. Well, you just take like you say before. You can't just take what works in the office and transplant it home. Uh, Joff has a question. How do you balance the swing to remote working for those who do not want to or can't remote work? Um, also, some jobs cannot be remote. How do you reward them for trudging into work when colleagues do not have to for their jobs? Basically, tips for getting all staff to buy in. It's a challenging one, isn't it? Um, there will be some people who don't want to, who don't have the space. Um, or I know, tragically, I know that some large financial services firms have had to prioritise women who are at risk of uh, domestic violence to come back to office because they don't have a safe environment. And there will be people who can't or won't want to work in the office. And, and that, as you say, there will be roles that um, for which it just isn't appropriate. Again, I always go back to clear communication. You know, if we give people agency, if we give people options, explain what the office is for um, and recognize that it's, it's not going to be appropriate for everyone. So if we have like an open discussion and communication about why some roles are prioritized to come back, is it that you, uh, you manage sensitive data? Is it that you need access to particular equipment? We'll also give people those options to, to, uh, to opt in as well. Uh, open, effective and honest transparency, I guess, is, is the key here. OK, um, and so I'm going to end on one final question, really, from me. If there is one thing that people on this call can do today, this week, that would push them further on this journey to being a more effective, uh, more open, transparent uh, remote team what would it be what's the, what you know what's the what's this kind of the, the first step what what can they do today I would say probably as leaders of some description in your organization improve your own communication skills so be much more work out loud to the extent that you can share much more around what you're doing because people will model that behavior on what you're doing so we all do what our line manager does if we want people to be much more um, sorry intentional about their communication. We kind of have to do that ourselves as well and lead by example. So are there ways that we can be more effective communicators and be more transparent what we're, about what we're doing ourselves so that others will do the same? And that as an organisation, we've got a greater awareness of what everyone's up to. Brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, you have our contact details there. I've put the link to book in for a 15 minute chat with uh, Sharon if uh, you want to. Uh, like I say, any questions, any thoughts, uh, you'll get emails. Please respond uh, to say that you were here. Um, and yeah, we'll uh, we'll finish there. Any questions, just drop either of us for line. Thanks, folks. Thanks Cheers. for joining. Thank you.